discussion entitled, The Effects of Mass Incarceration on Communities of Color in the Wake of COVID-19. I'm honored to serve as a moderator for today's discussion. I serve as a council member for the American Bar Association section of Civil Rights and Social Justice. I'm also principal of Melanie Bates Consulting LLC, a Washington DC based strategic policy and communications firm with an overall focus on criminal justice reform. Sponsored by the American Bar Association section of Civil Rights and Social Justice, this panel discussion is one of the many in a series of rapid response webinars. We are actively planning additional programming on a variety of issues. So please visit AmericanBar.org slash CRSJ for updates. During today's program, we encourage you to ask questions of our panelists through the Q&A function on Zoom, not the chat. If you do not see the controls, please ensure your screen is not idle. We will address questions at the end of the panel. We will also be sharing a recording of this program to everyone who has registered so that you can share it widely with your networks. And I'm told that over 640 persons have registered for the program today. So thank you so much for spending the afternoon with us for this critical discussion. We will address the effects of mass incarceration on communities of color during the COVID-19 pandemic. Living in horrific conditions, Individuals who are incarcerated have contracted COVID-19 at rates three times as high as others in the United States, and they have died from the virus at rates higher than the general population. Nationwide, fewer than 20% of individuals who are incarcerated in state and federal prisons have been vaccinated. We will discuss the life of persons returning home following a period of incarceration, collateral issues that they faced, and how to deal with these issues while enduring the, ensuring their dignity, health, and safety. We will also explore ways of supporting reentry and preventing recidivism, recently posed criminal justice reform legislation, and what you can do to help advocate for change. We believe it is imperative that the directly impacted population is a part of each and every conversation regarding reform. That is from idea formulation, to strategy development, to implementation, to post assessment. It should go without saying that directly impacted persons are on the front lines and can provide the most effective solutions to these complex issues. Their stories are powerful and should be at the core of any reform efforts. We collectively have a duty to ensure that a directly impacted person is included on any panel discussion, round table or meeting related to this topic. I'm pleased to note that today's panelists include directly impacted individuals who will speak to these issues from their own personal experience. We will now have opening remarks by our distinguished panel, and we will first hear from attorney Jarrett N. Adams. Attorney Adams was wrongfully convicted of sexual assault at age 17 and sentenced to 28 years in a maximum security prison. After serving nearly 10 years and filing multiple appeals, Attorney Adams was exonerated with the assist assistance of the Wisconsin Innocence Project. Attorney Adams used the injustice he endured as inspiration to become an advocate for the underserved and often uncounted. As a first step, Attorney Adams earned his JD from Loyola University Chicago School of Law in May 2015 and started a public interest law fellowship with Anne Cla Claire Williams, judge for the Seventh Circuit of the United States Court of Appeals. This is the same court that reversed Attorney Adams' conviction. An adjunct professor uh, from 2014 to 2015, Attorney Adams is a recipient of the 2012 Chicago Bars Foundation Abraham Lincoln Moravitz Public Interest Scholarship. Attorney Adams joined the Innocence Project Litigation Department as the department's first post-conviction litigation fellow in July 2016. Attorney Adams is the author of Redeeming Justice, from defendant to defender, my fight for equity on both sides of a broken system. In this work, Attorney Adams recalls the journey that led to his incarceration and inspired him to devote his life to fighting the many injustices in our legal system. Attorney Adams, the floor is yours. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to present today um, and I'm honored to be on the panel uh, with so many people that I do know and Michael and people that I'm getting to know as well. Um, I want to uh, I want to incorporate some slideshows in my presentation. Uh, just to you know, as I am speaking, the the words will be brought to life. I mean, I think that they're a lot more impactful. It's one thing for me to tell you that I was a kid and I experienced the work that the criminal justice system had to offer, 
But when you see it, it just takes on a life of its own. So I'll begin my slideshow now. So I am and Jared Adams as Melanie. Um, so so greatly introduced. I like that introduction. That was that was wonderful. You hit every button. Um, my story started as a 17 year old kid on the south side of Chicago. I was born and, and raised there, uh, raised by my mother um, and and my aunts and my and my grandmother. And and this was in the 80s, right before we saw the destruction that the, the crack epidemic uh, did on on the African American community. I, I don't have a story of, of me being, you know, deep in the streets and, uh, you know, change my life around, which, which, which to make this even more scarier. So this is a picture of me, 17 years old, graduating high school. And I'm looking up at this lady uh, yelling my name and, and how proud she was of me. And that was my mother. Um, not too, too long after this picture, during the summer, uh, a couple of friends and I decided to go to a college party in Wisconsin. And very quickly, this picture turned into a booking photo. Um, and at the age of 17, when I was supposed to be on my way to college in the fall, I was on my way to defending myself uh, for a crime in which I didn't commit. There was a lot to learn about the law that we simply just did not know. Uh, my only experience with the law was law and order. And when Dick Wolf theme music came on, you very rarely saw um, a wrongful conviction back in the 90s when, when uh, you know, when, the, when, when I was watching this. And so we hadn't had any experience with the law and we were um, lacked of resources uh, and we were appointed a court, a court appointed attorney. And in large part, that changed the trajectory of my life instantly and, and, and forever. We were, um, you know, advised by counsel that, you know, the case against us was, was, was so thin that the best strategy was to go with a no defense theory. Now, as an attorney, I'm sitting here and I know that that is a malpractice theory. But as a kid and I'm sitting there with my mother, you know, it sounded like a good idea. And, you know, at, at the same time, you know, I, I knew that uh, although I committed no crime, you know, it was me who snuck out the house to go to this party and my friends who used uh, me as their alibi. And I told my mother I was spending the night over their house. And so I just wanted the coming back and forth to court to stop. You know, I didn't know um, that the strategy was 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 leading to my 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 uh, demise, but that's what it did. I ended up being sentenced to serve 28 years in prison um, in a case where just an accusation um, was the evidence in the case. I uh, was fortunate enough to get the attention of the West Wisconsin Innocence Project. I started to, to write as many people as I could. My education level was just the high school diploma. Uh, but I spent time tutoring as an HSED, um, you know, tutor for, for inmates trying to get their uh, high school uh, equivalency diploma, and it gave me access to the law library. And in the law library, I would write other attorneys, I would ask for help, uh, I drafted uh, a, a, a habeas petition, and an attorney by the name of Rob Hennick, uh, he agreed to help me edit it. Uh, we edited it through the mail. I sent it to the Innocence Project and they came um, and, and, you know, took my case on with, with like about, I, I want to say about 20 days or something like that until my deadline. And I never would have been able to bring my innocence claim. So here it is, you know, I'm in prison, trying my best, pro se, no resources for a lawyer. And had I not had an opportunity to get in touch with the Innocence Project, I would have been going by myself you know, I wouldn't have had an attorney afforded to me. So my conviction was reversed with the help of the Innocence Project on the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. The conviction was reversed, but the damage in the, in the missing gap in my resume was not. Um, you know, the conviction uh, and, and the incarceration went from 1998 to 2007. There was a lot of things that I missed out on in, in life. You know, there, um, there were, were no cell phones like you see them today, back in, you know, 1998. Uh, you, you know, there were things that, that it was just shell shocking to me how much the world had improved while I was incarcerated. So one of the things that I got out and I did was, you know, my mother and my aunts, I recognized that the benefit that I had in going through something that's horrible um, and, and, and as, as that situation was and having my conviction reversed, I realized that 
I came home with something that was invaluable, and that was my youth. Many of the folks who are incarcerated wrongfully, they're there for over 10 years, over, over 15 years. And also when they come home, you know, sometimes they're the only leaf left on their family tree. So I had the support of my mother, of my aunts, and these were, were educated women who understood that you don't go through something like the criminal justice system without, you know, having it impact you. And so they made sure that I got the mental health care and therapy that I needed. And, you know, it is in large part the reason why I was able to put things together and to get to where I am now. So in, in, in that journey and starting in 2007 when I was released, starting mental health care, having a family support, enrolling in school, and ultimately graduating, you know, from Loyola Law School uh, in, in 20, you know, 15, um, I started to realize that I needed to take, take notes and document. You know, I needed to not act like this just happened to me. I needed to not act like I didn't see the carnage that was taking effect in the communities in which I came from and I was released to. So as I started to go through law school, I started to, to, to network and make good friends. And I started to take journals and, and, and do studies. And, you know, now I don't just get up and tell the story. I'm able to point to the facts of the numbers. And when you look at these numbers, these numbers are ridiculously scary. So this is, you know, a, a graph and it, and, and it doesn't even go off to where we are right now. So it's a pretty old graph, but it, it shows you the, the prison boom. Um, that we had in, in America. And, you know, when we talk about it, it's one thing, but when you look at the numbers, it makes you now have more questions, right? So how did we, what was it? Because we know, it, you know, crime has been going on. So we know it wasn't just some, some crime that made this thing spike up. So what was it? So as I started to do more research, um, I started to realize that a lot of the, 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 the prison spike and spike was driven by business. You had corporations that were springing up out of nowhere, right? CAA is 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 one corporation, and it was founded. You know, do you think it's, it's a coincidence that they were founded during the time that that we started to see the rise? I mean, I don't. You know, some of these companies, if you're not sure what exactly they do, some of these companies, when you're in prison. There's not a, an Amazon part where you can just pick from any vendor. They're usually just one or two to choose from. And, you know, when you have that, you have almost a monopoly, so to speak. That's not just that. There are prison phone calls. We know prisons are placed in the middle of nowhere, away from everyone. So the only lifeline you have to the outside world is prison calls. Some of these prison calls, first minute, is about... $10, $15 and the rest is, you know, 30, 40 cents or whatever it is. But if you think about that in numbers of we have 2.3 million people incarcerated, you're talking about a lot of money. And if we follow the money, we'll follow the problem with what we're really having in our criminal justice system. So I, you know, didn't want to just stop the studying. And this is Keith Finley. This is co-counsel um, and you know, he was co-counsel on a case in which I was able to, you know, to, to work with the Innocence Project, and we were able to get a conviction reversed. But I, I showed this picture for a me for a reason, because I don't want anyone to, to think that I somehow went to prison and they were handing out smart pills on my way in. This was talent I possessed all along, and it could have been blown out before it even had its chance to be to, to exist, had it not been for a number of different fortunate circumstances. What I found was this, it wasn't just me. There are a number of different Jared Adams that deserved saving, that deserved our attention. And they came from these communities that we always see get the short end of the stick. We always see it. It doesn't matter who's in office. It seems like the African-American community and the communities of color, they always get the short end of the stick. You wanna talk about um, the pandemic. Um, these these numbers and graphs, these graphs were were collected from a number of different states who did their own research. So I don't want to make it seem like I did this all on my own. I'm highlighting the different states' um, Department of Justice's numbers 
And when you look at these numbers and you talk about, you know, you talk about the pandemic and you talk about the releases. So you're talking about, you know, 2018, 2019, 2020, you can see, you know, there, there was, there was no true. All right, let's hurry up and get people out. Um, you know, in this, uh, even in terms of ad admissions, I think that we need to go back and look at and see the numbers um, and the effects of the compassionate release. Because as an attorney, you know, I was prosecuting, uh, as, an, as an attorney, I'm dealing with prosecutors uh, for compassionate releases all the time. And I can tell you guys, it's not as simple as the memo that came across from the Department of Justice and making it seem like, well, if your client fits this criteria, then you just fill this out and he has the opportunity of getting out. It was the opposite. And I'll get to that in my next slide, but this is more, you know, just the monthly releases, you know, from, from different states. I mean, and you can look and, and, you know, I mean, in some of these states, 2019, they released more people than they did in the year of the pandemic. Like these numbers just don't lie. And I, I think that if we could take away from all of the debating, and get down to the numbers, I think that we'll all find a common place and that this needs to change no matter what side that you're on. I mean, you look at how the, the Bureau of the Prisons, they, they approved less than 1% of the compassionate release filings. And I can't speak to all of what was in those filings, but I can directly tell you that I filed several with the help of an amazing attorney named my angel Cody, um, who's, who's been successful in our own right. And, and, and in particular, when we were tackling this, there were a number of federal defender offices all across the country. I wanna make sure I give them a shout out who was collectively putting these numbers together. And we were seeing real time that they were not letting people out as they should have. There were people who had, who had met the criteria of, you know, you got this much time in, nonviolent, and it didn't really matter. There was always some type of mechanism to be a barrier. And here again, it's the situation where the politics, and we are not getting down to the effect because of the politics. There is a budget for every state, and this particular budget is with the DOJ federal. I do mostly federal in my practice, but if you look at this, herein lies the problem of the results that we're having. 60%, 62% of the budget, and we're talking about billion dollar budgets that are, that are you know, passed every year for the Department of Corrections and the Department of Justice. So we got 60% on prison operations. Let me, let me dig between those words. Prison operations is the building you lock people up in, and, the, and what it takes to run them. That has nothing to do with corrections, you know, health care programming, mental health care, preparing people to be reintegrated back into society. So these numbers speak for themselves. 4% mental health care reentry, 4% community programs. You know, it, 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 it goes to this. How can we lock people up for years and decades at a time in animal like conditions? away from society, barely able to get in touch with society if you aren't able to afford these phone calls. And then we don't give them any proper programming and training to be able to reintegrate back into society. But then we also, you know, require them to now you go out and you, 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 you know, do what is right, even though you've been housed in a place that is fundamentally wrong for years. It makes no sense. I'll close, but I, I don't want to close without saying this. You know, we have to pay attention to what's coming out of the Supreme Court each and every day because they are reversing what took a lot of attorneys in the juvenile field a, a lot of work to do. Now, with the recent ruling in the Supreme Court, courts don't even have to consider whether or not a youth is, is rehabilitatable or any mitigating factor before they say you get a life sentence and you aren't fit to, to be back in society again. That goes against everything that the research and the science has said. And I know I'm preaching to the choir with most of the people who are here um, viewing this, but, but I may get to a couple new people. Um, but these numbers are scary because once again, 
who does this, who does it always disproportionately affect? Nine times more likely black youth. You go in deeper in these numbers. One in four, um, one in against one in 25. You go a little bit deeper into these numbers. Every day there's 48,000 youth. Now, the reason that I'm mentioning this is because of this. Through my experience, the people inside of the Department of Corrections and the adult corrections, they've had some type of encounter, you know, with the criminal justice system as youth at a high percentage. I don't want to give out a wrong number because just speaking in my experience with the people that I was incarcerated with almost of, of, of the 10 years that I was in Wisconsin, I thought that a number of these gentlemen knew each other from their neighborhoods. But it wasn't until I started to, to, to tutor them and work on our cases that I found out that they met in juvenile facilities years ago. So this is the biggest feeder that we have to the adult correctional facility. As I run towards my time um, and I pass it off to, to, to my panelists, I wanna say this, the criminal justice system and what needs to be done can be summed up in this story. Um, I never forget speaking at an event and the lady was like, you know, what you talk about goes right to the heart of the story of somebody, anybody, nobody. And I had never heard of it before. Well, pretty much I got exactly what she was saying and I've used it and incorporated it in my slides ever since. And the criminal justice story, the criminal justice system in America is about this. It's a story about four people named everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. There was an important job to be done uh, and everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but nobody did it. Somebody got angry about that because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought anybody could do it, but nobody realized that everybody wouldn't do it. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have. I, I say that to say um, and reiterate this, um, the criminal justice system and the way we're treating people in the communities in which you know we always see the population dominating from the, the communities of color, that is our civil rights issue. And you know, um, if you think about how how you know history depicts those who who got America to where it is, I want you to think about how history is going to depict how we handle this situation. This is our job, and when I say our job, I'm talking about lawyers. Okay, I'm talking about lawyers. This country was founded on litigation. It's going to take litigation to get us out of the problem that we have with our criminal justice system. So so when we talk about uh, firms. We're talking about firms who make money and we're talking about pro bono. You know, we should be talking about diverting our attention to this pandemic because it's most certainly a pandemic. I thank you guys for allowing me the time to, to share my slides. Wow. Excellent, Attorney Adams. Thank you so much for sharing your dynamic personal story. We can truly feel your passion. And kudos to you for using your experience to fight for others. I think that imagery was incredible. You said that persons who are away for decades, they come home. They're the only leaf left on their family tree. We are putting people in animal-like conditions. The horrors of prisons for profit. I mean, all the data and the stats that you showed is really truly incredible and speaks to the core of these issues. So thank you for your presentation today. Next, we'll turn to Ms. Mimi. Ms. Mimi is a published author, artist, and entrepreneur. Originally from Nigeria, Ms. Mimi completed a summer bridge program at Northeastern University and then transferred to the University of Lynchburg, where she earned a Bachelor of Arts in Communication Studies with an emphasis in social influence in the spring of 2017. The following semester, Ms. Mimi was accepted to the university's Master of Arts program in nonprofit leadership studies. Ms. Mimi found freedom through writing. And because of the breadth of her experiences, she devoted to rendering light, love, and wisdom into the lives of others. At her young age, she's experienced immigration, imprisonment, isolation, betrayal, heartbreak, condemnation, and love. Through her poems, Ms. Mimi takes you on a journey and invites you to experience life with her in a land not her own, all by herself. She has creatively found an avenue to share love through her vulnerability, joy, and pain. Ms. Mimi is founder of the makeup line, Bolango, which contains her published poems on the inner packaging. 
This meaning empowers the individuals who use the product. The poems serve as words of affirmation to increase the beauty and self-love customers feel on the inside as its ritually saturated colors heighten each wearer's outer beauty. Thank you for being here today, Ms. Mimi. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for having me. I'm truly happy to be here. Uh, my name is Iswari Digifa, but I go by Mimi. Um, so I'm originally from Nigeria and I was previously incarcerated. And so prior to incarceration, um, I came to America on a study abroad scholarship. And when I got here, as Ms. Melanie uh, mentioned, I was in Northeastern University. So the plan was go to school, um, my bachelor's, my master's, a PhD, get a great job. So that was the whole goal and the whole plan. However, it didn't go that way. So after I was done with my bachelor's and I started my master's, during my master's program, I was incarcerated. It was like, it just seemed like my whole entire plan had ended. Um, the zeal wasn't there anymore. I wasn't as driven as I was. It just, it was like my whole world had just ended. And especially as a woman and a woman from a whole nother country in a different country that isn't mine with no family member or no one um, to support me. Um, so during that time, it was so many challenges and there were different things that I experienced and saw from you know, other women in that space. However, I found my zeal again. Um, so we had classes from Georgetown University and Howard University. So every program that the jail provided, I would apply and join. However, there were various programs that I would see that the men had, the women didn't have. Um, the men had a program called the YME, which is great to see. However, the women didn't have that same program and the women that continually um, said they needed something like that to be able to help them grow. So when I joined the classes, the schools, um, everything that I was able to join just to, you know, keep myself pushing and not just sit there doing nothing. I found my zill again. And during that time, I just took it and I ran with it. I became super hungry. And I said to myself, just because I'm going through the situation, just because it feels like this is my rock bottom, this is an end of the world for me. So I just kept pushing. Um, I was able to continue writing again. I wrote a poem almost every single day. And that's how I found out about the Georgetown Paver Program. So when I was released about, I think the first or second day after my release, I, I joined the Georgetown, I applied actually for the Georgetown Pivot Program. And it's a business and entrepreneurship program for previously incarcerated, incarcerated individuals. And so when they gave us stipend from that program, I just saved it up and published my first book. Now, like I said, I had to keep going. Um, even if you know this thing had happened and seemed like it was this dark cloud over me, I just kept pushing and I, w I didn't want to let that stop me. And coming from where I come from, it's a taboo for anyone to be incarcerated or be ever in that space. And as a woman as well, as like this tent had been placed on me, but I had to keep pushing because that was the only choice I had. Um, but in that space, I, you know, I heard different, so many different things. I saw how during visitation days, so during the men visitation days, those were the days that I had my um, my attorney law visitations. And when I walked into the hall, I would see that the hall was packed during the men visitation days. There was so many people there to visit them. However, when it was my visitation, the women's visitation days, I would only see maybe five individuals in there. So the women didn't have as much support at all. And my father actually came all the way from Nigeria every other month to visit me while I was there. But there were lots of people in there that didn't have anyone coming to see them. You would hear women just wishing they had letters, they had cards, they had the same support that women are given to men in those spaces, but they didn't have it. And even you know people that were there for um, um, substance abuse, um, women would, you would see them, they would come in there needing some type of rehabilitation, you know, um, support. But when they get in there, the incarcerated spaces fill them up with more medications and they just look like zombies. They, it, it changes them. You see them, they can't function. And when they go out there, they want this, this same, they're looking for a substitute to be able to help them. You know, since the whole time they've been in there for six months, they've been basically drugged up. And, you know, it was just sad to see that. And hearing all these different things from women, hearing, you know, not being able to have support, it was really sad. And when I got out, I just said to myself, you know what, I need to find some type of way to be able to support the women 
and writing the book, you know, reaching out to women that are still in there, telling them to read the book, you know, supporting them, making sure that, you know, they're still knowing that people are here for them, regardless of what they're going through. There are people that are still in here supporting them. And hearing women tell me, women that, you know, immigration, women, immigrant women and black women, women that have been through whatever, it doesn't even necessarily have to be incarceration, but whatever difficulty in life, hearing them say to me, oh, if you were able to go through this, I, I can, you know, prevail from whatever I'm going through right now. I can prevail from whatever struggles or any difficulty I'm going through. That makes me happy. And I just want to continually serve in whatever way that I can. And so when I first, when I published my book last year, June, um, that was an end for me because I said, I've always wanted to start my own business, but I just didn't know where to have a business in or what particular thing to do. And when I joined the Georgetown Pivot Program, I was able to think of Flulango. So Flulango, the name is actually my grandmother's first and last name, Florence Kalango. And I incorporated my poetry and makeup and the whole essence of Flulango is to make women feel, or any individual or the users makeup to feel beautiful both inside and out by these products. So, um, so seeing, seeing, hearing just the reviews from customers, hearing them say to, to me, um, you know, you make me feel beautiful. You make me feel amazing. You know, beauty isn't only in the outside. It's deeper than that. Knowing that people feel beautiful just inside as well, reading this poetry and feeling empowered and feeling great, that makes me happy. And I just continually want to serve and hearing, you know, all these great things and hearing that people are still doing better, regardless of whatever issue you're going through, or whatever situation, that makes me happy. And I'm truly happy and just, and it makes me super happy to just see people doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Miss Mimi. Thank you so much for sharing your heartfelt testimony. And we are so happy that you found your zeal to keep pushing. You truly are having an impact on all of the women um, that you've touched and, and just overcoming and highlighting um, the need to have different focuses and areas um, for women and the special circumstances that they face. So thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much. We'll now turn to Professor Michael Pernard. Professor Pernard is the co-director of the clinical law program at the University of Maryland, Francis Key Carey School of Law. Professor Pernard has published law review articles and op-eds on the criminal process, criminal defense lawyering, lawyering excuse me, race in the criminal legal system, policing and the interconnections between the re-entry of individuals with criminal records and the collateral consequences of criminal convictions. Professor Pernard has worked to improve the criminal legal system nationally and locally through legislative and policy advocacy, writing and participation in various working groups and advisory groups. Professor Pernard has served as a board member of the Public Justice Center, an advisory committee member of the Maryland Reentry Partnership and the Prisoner Reentry Institute at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. In 2011, Professor Pernard was honored as a champion of change by the White House for his work on behalf of individuals with criminal records. Thank you for all of your hard work and dedication, Professor Pernard. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. So first of all, can, can you hear me? I just wanna make sure I can be heard, okay. So first, I, I wanna thank um, the ABA Civil Rights and Social Justice section for putting on this program. Um, and it's an honor to be here with you, Melanie, as well as uh, with you, Mimi, and, and with you, Jared. So thank you for, for all that you uh, have been doing. So I, I live and work um, in Maryland. And Maryland, I consider to be the epicenter of mass incarceration, at least today. So here in Maryland, we have the most racially disproportionate prison population in the country. So in a state with a little over 30% of our general population who's black, over 70% of our prison population here is black. For those who serve 10 more years of their sentence right here in Maryland, nearly 80% are black. So when we talk about mass incarceration, it's, it's more than just the sheer numbers of individuals who we incarcerate in our prisons and jails. It's, it's more than the fact that we are the world's highest jailer. It's also about how we incarcerate, right? It's about the impact of mass incarceration, which really is about mass removal on individuals, families, and communities. It's about the economic engine that's our carceral state. And really, you know, as Jared said, mass incarceration is really about us, right? It's about what it says about us as residents, as stakeholders, and as lawyers, right, in this profession. So the United States is, is unique 
Um, it's just unique in the sheer effort and intentionality that we put into isolating and separating our incarcerated population from us. When we incarcerate, we, we cast people aside, right? Through our laws, policies, and practices. Essentially, we're telling them that they are no longer part of us and therefore they are not worthy of inclusion in our communities. So think about the fact that prisons tend to be located, you know, in remote rural areas far away from, you know, uh, our, our cities and, and more heavily um, populated suburbs where, you know, most of the people come from who are incarcerated. Think about just the cost of phone calls alone, right? How you separate that person from his or her family because of the, these usurious phone rates. Think about the pennies that incarcerated individuals are paid per hour, per day, per month, per year for the jobs that they are required to work. Um, and, you know, when we talk about this isolation, at least when I talk about it, just as one example, I talk about voting in prison. So our votes in this country, our fights rather in this country around voting rights of, of individuals who've been through the criminal justice system, it's really about where the individuals who have been released should be able to vote. That's where we're fighting and that's what our debates are about. We have two states in this country, Maine and Vermont, where individuals can vote in prison. And then we also have the District of Columbia, which last summer extended the franchise to residents who are incarcerated for a felony. But in at least 16 countries, people actually vote in prison, right? So countries such as Canada and Denmark, Finland, Spain, South Africa, and you know, there've been court decisions in some of these countries um, on these particular issues. And, and these, these court decisions are really about what the justices point out is about the, connect, the connectedness to those who are incarcerated. That is, they don't believe that folks who are incarcerated should be excluded from having a voice in their communities, right? That the only thing that truly separates folks who are in prison from folks who are out is just a sheer fact of incarceration. Everything else, they try to sort of replicate as best as possible. But here in our country, it's really the exact opposite. And I think about that in the context of reentry, because we often say that, that individuals leaving prison are quote unquote, reentering society, right? As if they've been totally removed from this thing that we call society, right? Um, as Jared points out, we're also unique and how it is we incarcerate children. We actually, we actually sentence children to die in prison. That makes us fairly unique. And so all of this connects to COVID-19. And, and COVID um, has really exposed, to use um, Melanie's words, has really exposed you know, sort of the dignity and humanity that, that is sort of, um, that is given to people, it's given its communities, right? We see this whole sort of priority in terms of the vaccines and we see the folks who had the work during the pandemic, the folks who expose themselves to this, to this virus every single day, you know, last summer and throughout. Prison and jails, are, right? They are petri dishes, right? Individuals live in close, crowded, unsanitary confines. Prison staff, you know, leave and re-enter every day, right? Essentially they're super spreaders. Viruses and disease spread easily and rapidly. Health is compromised. And as Jared has pointed out, COVID-19 has had a devastated impact in our prisons, right? Melanie said this, right? The infection rate in prisons is three times higher than the general population. Overall in this country, nine in 100 individuals in the general population has been infected with COVID. In our state prisons, it's been 34 out of 100. Out of 100. So it's about a third. In federal prisons as well, about a third of our incarcerated population has been infected. In Michigan, the infection rate in prison is 76 out of 100. COVID has killed those in prison at higher rates than the general population. At least 2,700 people have died in our state prison system as of last month. And then we see sort of the priority in terms of vaccinations, right? Melanie points out fewer than 20% of our individuals living in prison have been vaccinated compared to about 43% of the adults in the United States, okay? And then we also look at COVID and the priorities um, that have been given uh, by correctional officials as well as court orders to release individuals 
um, from prison to sort of reduce the risk of infection. And this really has been focused on individuals serving time for nonviolent offenses. Certainly pretty much, you know, when we think about individuals who've been serving time for violent offenses, who've been there for decades, it's been a non-starter to have conversations about whether we should include them in the individuals who should be looked at for release in light of this pandemic. And when we talk about reentry, um, I'd like to focus just very briefly on collateral consequences, which are the legal obstacles that stand in the way of individuals being able to truly move on once they're released from incarceration, right? These are civil penalties that, you know, find themselves in all types of codes, right? Um, and they're really vestiges of our tough on crime movements, our war on drugs of movements. And you saw in Jared's chart, really the spike in incarceration in the 80s and 90s. And that's when we see a lot of these collateral consequences hit the books. So, you know, um, housing, right? Individuals with a criminal conviction have a very difficult time accessing federally subsidized housing. They're often excluded because of their records from accessing housing. In the private housing context, um, Professor Deborah Archer from NYU Law School writes about crime-free housing ordinances, which are local laws that encourage or require landlords to evict or exclude tenants who've had contact with the criminal justice system. As Professor Archer argues, these, these, ordinance, or these ordinances are not about minimizing crime, but really about excluding racial minorities from these neighborhoods. Obviously, we all know that there's a raft of, 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 of laws that prohibit access to employment for individuals with criminal records, prohibit access to student loans and, and bank accounts. Um, and then we think of our sort of civic responsibilities, jury service. According to the Prison Policy Initiative, 44 states ban people with felony convictions from jury service after they've been released from incarceration. So we're not only isolating individuals civically in this context, right? But we're also reducing jury diversity. It's important to have diverse juries. One in three black men in this country have a felony conviction, right? Which obviously impacts everything we're talking about it, but I'm just giving you that, that, that sort of horrific stat just in the context of, of jury diversity. And then this is where I'll end, voting, right? We've had significant progress over the last several years with regard to extending the right to vote to individuals once they leave prison, right? But the sentencing project still estimates that nearly 5.2 million people today are disenfranchised because of a felony conviction. In Florida, 1.1 million people cannot vote, even though they've been released from prison, right? Mostly because they cannot afford to pay court fees and fines, or they don't, they don't know how much they have to pay. Um, so overall, in this country, one in 16 Black adults are disenfranchised, and 1.2 million women are disenfranchised because of a criminal conviction. And I'll end there. Thank you so much, Professor Pernard, for all of your powerful insights, expertise, insights, articles, quotes. We have a lot to absorb and to, and to dig in deeper on. So thank you so much. And thank all of you for your opening remarks. Um, it's really been a robust discussion thus far. We're now going to turn to uh, um, a few discussion questions before we open the floor to the audience um, for their own questions. Um, I thought we could dig a little bit deeper about the impact on our incarcerated brothers and sisters who are behind the wall serving time now during COVID. Attorney Adams mentioned animal-like conditions. And these are people who are already experiencing horrific conditions on a day-to-day -day basis, being told when to eat, sleep, use the restroom, being subject to lockdowns to manage um, the virus and other just unthinkable circumstances. Um, do any of you have anything to add about the impact on COVID um, while people are away? You know, I, I, think that, I, I think that we've yet to see all of its totality, right? Because a couple of my clients have, have, they contracted it, but now they're complaining about other things, right? So they were able to get through, you know, but one of my clients was like, man, I got a small ache in my back, you know, and it started with this. So I think that not only is it just, you know, for folks who are incarcerated, but society itself, you know, the effects of, of contracting it is one thing, getting through it is another thing, and any ailments as a result of your body getting through it, you know, we don't know yet. And I, and I, you know, I, a lot of, a lot of the treatment of prisoners goes right to the heart of 
the narrative, right, of who we should and should not give empathy and sympathy to. And so if we're able to paint folks in a light that, well, you shouldn't feel bad, well, then folks won't, they won't feel bad. I mean, and then if you don't feel bad, you're not compelled to do what's right. And so in this situation, I, I think that, that there's more litigation that needs to be done. And, and you know, within the Department of Justice and, you know, all throughout the state about, okay, now, now that, that we see the light at the end of the tunnel in terms of, you know, vaccination and stuff like that, you know, well, what about the other elements? I mean, people out, out now are saying, you know, look, I, I got through it, but, but my taste isn't back yet. So we have to expect and understand that if it's hitting us hard, it hits people who are unable to, to isolate. They can't isolate. They can't go anywhere. It hits them even harder. Um, and so I just, I just think that we, we have to find a way to, to maybe even possibly get the CDC involved directly with, you know, the prison system and population. Because if folks are getting out, then they're coming where? Right, right back amongst us. So I, I think that we need to look, and, and Michael, whenever I, I get the opportunity to be around Michael, uh, man, he's like a walking encyclopedia to me, man. I mean, because he has so much information and he says stuff that just triggers me to thinking about other things. And what, I, what I'm saying by that is this, we, 90, if not higher, percent of the people who are incarcerated, they're not there for life or on death row. So that means that they'll be coming back into our society. Don't you think that it's in our best interest to make sure that we're preparing the people who are coming back amongst us to be both in good health physically and mentally? I, I guess that's my point on that. Excellent, thank you. Do any of the other panelists have anything else to add to that point? Great. Um, so we spoke about many people are coming home. What can we do to better support those coming home with the necessary resources to thrive? Um, you mentioned again, Attorney Adams, about people being the only leaf left on their family tree. Um, people are away from decades coming home to a world that looks nothing uh, like when they left. For us, people on the outside, it's hard to navigate and really um, comprehend having to wear a mask every time that we leave home. We can't engage in regular routine activities anymore. We are going years now almost without seeing family and friends. So how can we support those who are coming home after a period of incarceration into this new normal, if you will? And that's for me or-, or, or Any of the panelists. Yeah. Um, Michael, you wanna take this one? Yeah, I mean, I'd say just, just, to, just to start it off, um, you know, when we talk about these sort of legal penalties that, that really hold people back. And, and by the way, the American Bar Association has done an, you know, amazing work on these consequences. I mean, about a decade ago, over a decade ago, the, the ABA um, published um, model standards for attorneys representing individuals in the context of collateral consequences. The ABA wrote a report, again, going back over a decade, um, documenting nationally the tens and thousands of, of these consequences. And so I think one of the things that, that we should do as lawyers and also, again, just community members is, is sort of understand, you know, the legal obstacles and, and fight to sort of, you know, do away with unnecessary legal obstacles to reentry. That's on the law side. On the non-law side, you know, again, we as attorneys as well, right? Employers have lots of discretion. Licensing agencies have lots of discretion. Landlords have lots of discretion in terms of who it is they give a job to and who they don't give a job to, who they rent to, who they don't, right? I think lawyers can do um, a lot of work sort of educating um, individuals, decision makers, right? Um, about individuals who are being released, about these obstacles, right? Um, because first of all, you know, um, to Jarrett's point, as well as to Mimi's point, you know, these are individuals who serve their time, right? These are individuals who, you know, they paid their debt. And once you pay their debt, at least how I grew up, once you pay your debt, you don't own anything anymore. But for them, these folks, they, they you know, want to pay the debt, you know, till, till they die, right? Um, the other thing as lawyers, I think that, that we can do, um, and we, many of us do it, right? But, you know, thinking about um, Melanie, your question about, particularly in the context of COVID, but really, really any time, but just in terms of the adjustment process, is really incorporating social workers into our work, who are expert um, in providing sort of the wraparound holistic services 
um, that many individuals needs need upon upon release. Yeah, and I and I can piggyback on one thing. You know, have now I'm practicing law, but my mother, me and my mother, constantly have conversations. You know about what we learn going through and what's going on right now. And the, and the one thing that's that's always missed is this: when we talk about people being released and going home, what is home, right? So home is somebody else's house that's either been approved by the parole board or it was the only, only house you could find. And so then we, we talk about the, the, the victims, you know, by not raising their hand, meaning this, the families that people come home to, the communities that people come home to, you know, they didn't raise their hand and say, yeah, send, send the person that you've been housing and not teaching anything to in horrible conditions. Send them in our neighborhood. That's not what happens. So we have to, if you cannot find a sympathy and empathy for the actual person, how could you ignore the help that is needed by the family and the community? Exactly. Thank you so much for noting that. Uh, Ms. Mimi, I'm going to turn to you. You did a great job outlining um, the disparities for women and how the system impacts them different than men. What can we do to close this gap? What is the solution? How can we continue to lift up the voices of our, of our women and help close the gap? Um, thank you so much for that question. Um, programs, programs, just create more programs. Um, and I also agree with what um, Mr. Jarrett said. Um, housing, women, and that's for in general, not just women. Housing is one of the one of the most important things when people are returning home. Um, like the very important things like their ID and social security numbers. It was very hard for myself and a group of people when we returned back home to be able to get these things, even jobs. It's hard to find jobs when you are um, previously when you were previously incarcerated, um, but more programs should be available to women in those spaces and when they get out as well. Um, the CFLS is doing one. Um, there should be more things like that, like the CFLS, what they do, they're doing a great job helping the women that were previously in those spaces. But things like that, we need more things like that to be able to help women. Great, and I'll let Attorney Adams and Professor Pernard jump in if you have any thoughts on that point. No, I think I think Mimi captured everything. Said it all. Yeah, yeah, she she does, and I I um I am actively now, um, and this is for any attendees and stuff like that. So you know my we my firm you know we do a lot of civil litigation, um, but we also we have a nonprofit, you know, I, predominantly I've been handling male cases. I'm actively looking for cases to offer pro bono services to women because Mimi's right. You know, she's right. I, I don't, you know, and it's, I know what it's like to be in there as a man, but I don't, you don't know what it's like to be in there as a woman. I, and I can only imagine because, you know, they're treated, you know, just as worse. Women, women are treated just as worse. And a lot of their, their issues are ignored and not understood because this is a male predominantly designed system. And so um, I think that we all should listen to folks, you know, like Mimi who went through it because, and I think I used this, this analogy before um, with, with you, Melanie. When you, when you think about things that, are, that go wrong, the people who are around it the most or use it the most usually know how to fix it but they just either can't afford to do an overhaul so they find something you know, to fix it. Not, I'll give the TV example. Something goes wrong with the TV or the remote control. Well, you've been using that for years. You know how to get the tape and fix the button or get the hanger or do whatever. So why can't we do that with our criminal justice system, especially in specific women um, issue incarceration related things? We need to seek out and, and, and elevate women to leadership positions, including men as well, um, you know, as well. We can learn a lot from someone that, that Michael recently represented who spent how many years? 30 something years, 40 something years. You know, we need to be asking this, this brother, well, how did you do that? You know, what is it that we can do to shorten that? Because if the, if the, system, if the system kept you that long, then they, they tried to make an argument that you weren't ready for release until after 40 years. Brother, what can we do? What can we pour out of your brain to figure out how to fix these young kids from doing 40 years and women, what can we what can we learn from you? So that's the thing that I'm hoping that we're able to do. 
that's excellent. Thank you so much. I think that hones in on our theme of, of centering the solutions on the voices of those with a lived experience. So thank you for, for bringing that up and Professor Pernard's client. Thank you. Um, next, I'm going to ask about the system. Um, it contains a multitude of stakeholders, a judge, an attorney, a prosecutor, a juror. What role do each of these persons play on the disparities that we're seeing? And how can they help change the system to produce more favorable outcomes? Ooh, Professor Bernard, I believe you're on mute. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I was muted. Um, I, I'll, I also want to, there, there are lots of great suggestions in the chat as well on these issues, but in terms of, um, you know, prosecutors, right? We, we know that, that prosecutors are the most powerful entity in, in the criminal um, justice system. And, you know, I, I think they have to be willing to give up some power, right? Um, that's number one. Um, I think that prosecutor officers, and I'm speaking, you know, very, very broadly, need to ensure that everyone they hire, right, is, is committed to seeing justice in ways that are very, very holistic. So the issues that, that Jared and Mimi are talking about, like how long is too long and why do we even have these, these sort of decades long of incarceration, particularly for young folks, right? That, you know, we need prosecutors to be, to, to understand the true enormity, right? Of their decisions. I think ideally it would be great, right? To hire prosecutors from the communities where the prosecutor resources are concentrated, right? I think prosecutors should be aware of the communities where they work. Like we often talk in times, we often talk about, you know, when we talk about policing reform, we talk about how officers should live in the communities where they, where they patrol, right? Um, we should have a similar requirement for prosecutors, right? Um, in terms of dealing with helping, help, help, helping to respond to just the crisis of over-incarceration, right? Prosecutor officers, and, and, and several are, right? Um, they should be amenable to perhaps joining motions that Jared is filing, right? To help individuals leave prison. Certainly, they have, can have much to say about the need to reduce, in terms of this COVID-19, in terms of reducing infection by limiting you know, new arrests, and we see some prosecutor officers that have stopped, pro stopped prosecuting certain low-level crimes. Um, certainly, again, prosecutors can push for early release, and prosecutors, you know, can use their power to ensure the sanitary conditions, right, that really should exist in prisons at any time, but certainly in, in, in light of this pandemic, you know, it's more critical now than at least, you know, than perhaps ever. So those are just a couple of things in terms of prosecutors. Great. Attorney Adams, do you have something? Man, how long I got? <laughs> okay. um, but yeah, I mean, like, like Michael said, look, the prosecutor is the the most powerful piece on the chessboard, okay? You could save a lot of time. So, you know, we are actively litigating actual claims of innocence right now. We have what we need in a number of these different cases. But the gatekeeper is the the, the prosecutor. You understand? And, and that, that that is that, you know, and I don't, I, this might not be the, the best quote, but I'll quote Kanye here. No one man should have all that power, okay? So that, that shouldn't be what, what, because you cannot, you cannot, you cannot ask someone to not believe, prosecute, or threaten to prosecute the people that they're gonna need on the next case. So if we have prosecutors and they know that officers are, are given, you know, bad testimony, not telling the truth. I mean, what's the chances of them, you know, holding them accountable when they're going to need them in the next courtroom for another case? So it's that relationship that needs to be, you know, a wedge has to go in between that. And, and judges need to stop, um, you, you know, just, just calling more than balls and strikes. I know that's their job, so to speak, but it's like, you can tell when something isn't right, isn't wrong. I've had many of meetings inside of chambers and stuff like that where judges, you know, go above and beyond. And so what we have to do is this, we have to find a way to start doing more research on the numbers. If we have judges and prosecutors, we have numbers that are showing us what it is, then we, we have to find a way to groom the next person, 
you know, who is educated on these issues that we continue to have. I think that we cannot, cannot ignore the fact that we've gotten ourselves into a situation where we are the greatest nation, but the greatest incarcerator, like Michael said. And so we can't be both. We can't be both, all right? So we got to figure it out. And I think starting to figure it out is not putting um, a new faucet on um, plumbing that we know needs to be torn up and replaced. Thank you, Attorney Adams. Uh, Professor Pernard, did you have anything else on that question? No. Okay. Chair, Great. I wrapped it up beautifully. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so next, let's talk about uh, legislation and policy. Are there any current proposals out there that will help resolve the issues that we've been discussing today? Um, you know, yes, the answer is yes. Um, and also there has been some legislative progress um, at the state level, you know, over the past um, few years. And I'll, I'll just give um, a couple, you know, of examples. Um, it's it's going to be sort of scattershot, but, but Washington State, this session, right, just a month ago, um, enacted a law that allows all formerly incarcerated individuals to vote, even when they're on probation and, and parole. Um, California, there's been recent legislation that allows individuals with felony convictions to serve on juries, right? And tell me, 30% of Black men in California have been barred um, from serving. Um, in the chat, um, I saw some suggestions about, well, not suggestions, but in terms of employment for individuals with criminal records, um, there was some mention of ban the box um, laws, and we've seen those proliferate, proliferate rather, you know, across the country at the local levels as well as the state levels. I think some people sort of have a quibble a bit about the, the effect, effectiveness of it, but but certainly that is major, major progress in terms of, you know, telling us all, not only employers, but telling us all that, that criminal records are actually not relevant at all, right, um, to to individuals when they are, and to employers when, when applicants are applying Um for jobs, um, we've seen over the past few years, uh, many states have, have expanded opportunities for expungement um, and sealing, including now a move for automatic expungement and sealing that would re relieve an individual of the burden of actually having to apply um, for expungement. Washington, D.C., right, just last month, getting back to Jared's point about our young folks who are incarcerated for too, too long, but they passed, I know, Melanie, I know you all, I know you know all about this, but they passed the second Look, Amendment Act, which would allow individuals who are incarcerated, right, who for serious crimes that they committed before 25 years old, to actually petition for resentencing after serving 15 years. Um, Maryland actually this session passed a similar law, but it's, you know, it doesn't go up to 25 years old, but it's for individuals who, who committed crimes before 18, they can petition for an adult offense, they can now petition a court after um, one year. So, you know, those are among um, some some legislation that 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 has been passed recently. I think moving forward, I think we should be paying attention to uh, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act in Congress. Right. Because part of that part of that um, bill um, talks about the need to, to train officers on racial bias, as well as, you know, tamp down on the use of force, which obviously right contributes to who's incarcerated, who gets into the criminal justice system. Part of that act is about incentivizing officers to, to move into communities and to act as guardians and not warriors. Again, at the front end of the system, that's incredibly important as well. So, you know, I think I do think that there, there is lots of legislative activity, you know, at least over the course of the last year, we, we're seeing real pushes to uh, radically reimagine um, different components of, of the criminal justice system. Now, look, whether this stuff, whether these these efforts you know, are successful in the end, you know, that's to Jared's point. That's what we as attorneys, that's another thing we could be doing, right? Is sort of supporting these leg leg legislative efforts, right? And not let the attention fade away. Yeah, I mean, all of that. I mean, I, 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 look, Melanie, you know, um, the true criminal justice reform starts on the state level, because as we know how the constitution and how the laws are and stuff like that, there are just a number of bad laws. And, and they get snuck in under the cover of darkness and they're just bad. I'll give you an example. Um, one of my offices is in Chicago. So one of the worst laws ever is the armed career offender that they have, where if you have a certain 
I'll, I'll break it down to smaller terms. If you have two felonies in a certain category, it doesn't matter if they're violent or, you know, if they're in a certain category, if you are, are, are caught with the unregistered weapon, like you literally are facing a max of 25 to 30 years on that weapon alone. Forget whatever else it is that you're, and so I represent a guy uh, in the 80s, back when my community was going crazy, and he's an older gentleman. He picked up, you know, a marijuana offense, and I think, you know, some other type of nonviolent, non-gun offense. So the neighborhoods are bad in Chicago. So now he's getting a gun. He's a family man. He's taking his grandkids back and forth in a rough neighborhood. He gets pulled over. First offense in years. Now he's facing 30 years for just the gun alone. That is a horrible law. That law was designed to deter people from using weapons and stuff, but it, it left so much of a gray area that it's disproportionately affecting people of color. And, and so if we can acknowledge that, why does it take so long to go back and fix it? And then look, the government can do things to perpetuate and propel real justice reform on the state level. How many times have they incentivized states to do things for grant money, right? So why not do this? And and it, and this isn't this isn't the Jared Adams stand on a soapbox and go in on Biden and Kamala, but it wouldn't have been called first step if you wasn't gonna have two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight more nine steps behind it. So I'm waiting on them steps, is what I'm saying. So there's the first step. Where's the second, third, and fourth, and fifth step at? So I think that, you know, as we get the pandemic all the way behind us, it's time to deal with the next pandemic. And that pandemic is a criminal justice system. And if people want to know, well, how do we do that? Well, let's do the reverse. We saw a war on drugs that resulted in mass incarceration. So let's have a war on lack of education, a war on poor communities' access to education and to health care and to uh, better, better uh, job training. And then maybe we'll start having mass uh, uh, you, you know, communities of people who reintegrated back into successfully, society successfully. Maybe we'll have mass folks who are getting now the mental health care that they need in these communities. I'll say this lastly, when, when you have over, you got to think about this, think about a product. If a product came out and within one to two years, almost 50% or higher of that product came back to the warehouse, we will be shutting that warehouse down. So why aren't we treating the, 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 the pandemic of the criminal justice system the same way? On average, 50 to 60 people percent of people come back to prison within three years. 50% of the people who are incarcerated, if not higher, have been there before. So it's like, let's put some money where our mouth is and, and, and it's time to rest the slogans. Wow. Thank you so much, all of you, for all of your energy and, and critical um, contribution to this discussion. It's been immensely um, helpful to moving forward and, and finding solutions to these problems. Um, we're going to turn now to some audience questions. So feel free, panelists, just to hop off mute uh, whenever you'd like to provide a response. Um, our first comment, all of you have done a fabulous job of presenting a problem that has festered in this country since it began. My background. As a white civil attorney for 42 years, I work largely um, ignorant of the depth and cruelty of racial injustices practices. After a childhood during which my parents and grandparents from the South protected me from knowing about the cruelties and injustices around them and why they lived in the South. South. But I'm not in a position of writing checks to charities. What programs are you aware of that are working on solutions that can utilize the talents of retired attorneys? My nonprofit, Life After Justice, we're looking for some retired attorneys who are, are you know, who want to do work. We're virtual. Um, I'll, I'll make sure that I put it in the chat. Uh, we're, we're growing. We're doing issues. I want, I want you know, I want, um, I want people to think about this. When you think about something like the criminal justice system or any big issue, it's intimidating. It's huge. It's like a big mountain, like at the top, right? When you look, when you're at the bottom, it's intimidating looking at the top. So let's stop looking at the top and let's look at the middle. Let's get to the middle. 
And then we look back at the top. Once we get to the middle, it's not that far and intimidating. So I say that to say this, just do what you can. You, you, you know, if you if your time sometimes is more valuable than your money because you don't know where the impact of your money is going. So for the attorney who put that in the chat and any other attorney, please reach out. We have some work. We want to move increasingly now more in the area which, in, in which Mimi was talking about and, 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 and representing more um, pro bono women of color and, and, and dressing needs that way. So, I mean, even if you're not an attorney, do you know how many people we have helping us and our staff do research? Put together numbers, make you know letters to the 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 the, the, the legislators in their area. So don't think in in terms of man, it's just me. What can I do? I want you to think in terms of man, this is crazy. What can I do? Excellent. Any other responses to that question? Nope. Okay. Perfect answer. Great. Um, so we have another question. Would it help to rework the plea bargaining system of closed door handshakes to find resolve for the system? Um, yes, I think that, um, you know, our criminal justice system, as we all know, is a system of mass pleas, right? And, and our system or the system in its current form cannot survive without these mass pleas. And look, we all know about, you know, all the pleas that are taken every single day by folks who didn't do what it is they're pleading guilty to, right? And we know all the reasons why, you know, people plead guilty to something they didn't do, right? Because there's, there are incentives to do that, right? Um, and that's, you know, what our system is based on, right? It's based on incentivizing people to actually plead guilty and get this case over with. And then, you know, sort of the consequences of that. So I do think, you know, we should really ask, you know, what is it about our system? Why is it that we require these mass pleas and what we could just, what can we do about that, you know, at the front end? That's one thing. Um, certainly, you know, it's still the case at the local level, right? There's no Brady requirement, right? As part of the plea process. And so, you know, as a defense attorney, I would love to get the prosecutor's file before advising a client to plead guilty or not. Right. So that's something we can fight for as well. Like if we have the system of pleas, at least the defense attorney, as well as the client, right, should have the full file. Right. They should have they should know everything about this case before um, pleading guilty. Those are just, you know, two things. I, I You know, Matt, Michelle Alexander, I think it was about 10 years ago, she actually wrote an op-ed in New York Times called Crash the System, right? Again, recognizing that these mass pleas are, are what the system is all about. Now, you know, she came up with a proposal that's really, you know, as an attorney, right, you, you may not follow along with it because obviously we are clients that are attorneys, but her suggestion was, you know, everybody should just not plead guilty, like stop pleading guilty, right? And that system would collapse. So I'm not suggesting that. I just, that question reminded me of that, of that op-ed. Thank you. Um, there's a question um, asking, who do we write to advocate to eliminate this? And I'm assuming it just refers to the injustices overall. Um, and I would say there's a quote, I believe Thomas Jefferson, the government closest to the people serves the people best. So take time to seek out your local representative, make sure you're registered and you vote in local elections, find out when public hearings are held, go down to city hall, testify, be on record, write a letter to your, rec uh, your representative, tweet them, you know, post on social media, make your voice heard. You are there, they are there because of you. So I think starting with your local official and then moving up from there would be my approach. I don't know if the panelists have any other feedback on that. No, I agree. I mean, it starts on a local level. And then simultaneously, what we also need to do is this. And I, and I keep going back to this, you know, and in, in, including juveniles in this conversation as well, because that's our talent pool, right? You know, we, we, we have to do two, it's a two-pronged approach. Put the pressure on the people who are currently in office to do the right thing. And then we start to, to groom the replacer of the people who ain't doing the right thing. You, 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 you know, you look at, um, you, you look at the, the youth that we have right now, we're losing, we're losing talent. And I, I just, it's hard for, to get people to see that, you know, because they're not from these communities and, and they're just used to seeing the, the, the results, meaning this, when juveniles get in front of them, and for that, that part, any criminal defendant, it's like the court has a way of treating them 
as if they were born at the scene of their accusation. And I think that that, that lies in the, the big problem. So we have to put the pressure on the people who are currently tasked with doing the job. Um, and, and we might have to become creative because, because if I was responsible for a pet and I didn't take care of that pet and I let that pet be in some of the horrible, the worst conditions, you know, I could be held liable for neglect. So why can't we hold liable the politicians and the legislators who are responsible for the, 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 the communities right now that are suffering? And so I say that and I say this, we have to focus and save our babies from these communities because these babies, these kids, the youth, those are the replacements to the justice oppressors. Thank you, Attorney Adams. I'm going to turn to you, Ms. Mimi. We have a question um, that asks, is it possible to focus on teaching entrepreneurship versus getting a job so persons don't have to worry about barriers in getting a job? And you're an entrepreneur. You started your makeup line. You've written poems. You're a published author. Do you have any recommendations for this attendee? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for that question. Um, so that's so, like I previously stated, um, being an individual that was at that space is very hard to get a job, even like myself. Now, that's why I'm struggling with going through right now. Um, so entrepreneurship, it's, and that's the reason why the Georgetown Pivot Program, you know, went to that route, because they understand that people that were previously incarcerated is usually very hard um, for them to get jobs. So that way you can, you know, learn about your own business and grow your own business. So that's actually a great idea. Um, I wish that that would change. I I wish things were not that way, but sadly, that's how it is. Um, but as an individual that was in that space, if you have any business idea, just focus on that and grow that until the system changes. Excellent. Thank you, Ms. Mimi. I believe this is for you, Attorney Adams. What type of therapy did you receive? I too went from prison to law school and I'm in the midst of reentry. So it was, two, it was twofold. It was professional therapy and me and some strong black women therapy. Okay. So my, my mother's, my mother and my aunts, uh, my godmother, uh, she, you know, passed away since. But I mean, they they would just, you know, have conversations with me. And they were just like, look, you don't have to tell us everything you experienced and went through, but you know, like just talk to us, you know, let us know what you're experiencing and stuff like that. And so what I've learned is that it, it's it's the, the mental health care and the need for mental health care in the African-American community, it's, I don't know why it's, it's, it's so far apart or deemed as something being wrong with you, but it is. And, and so we need to start having conversations to make people comfortable enough to ask for help. And so I would, you know, convene with my mother and aunts and open up. I mean, it didn't come overnight. Like this was several uh, uh, Sunday dinners that, that it took. But then there was the professional help. And so my mother and my boss at the time, Carol Brooke, uh, I worked as an investigator at the Federal Public Defender's Office in Chicago, worked my way through undergrad and through uh, law school. And so Carol was the executive director of, um, you know, the Federal Public Defender's Office then, the Federal Defender. And so my mother and her developed a relationship and they both wanted to see me do well. They saw that I was just not doing anything else but going to school and working. And so they both together, you know, was able to find me, you know, therapy. But let me also say this, even if I had wanted to take and, and get therapy when I was first released, I couldn't do it because I didn't have any insurance. I was laying on my mother's couch. I didn't have a job. I didn't have any credit. I didn't have a bank account. So it was not designed for me to get to where I am. So because I am where I am, I will not ever miss the opportunity to remind folks of the talent that we're missing out of. We're missing out. We probably, we don't know if the person that's locked up that we've done away with could have already prevented this pandemic from reaching America. We don't know if, if the person we have locked up could be the next person to take us into the next century. I wanna fly around like the Jetsons if that's possible, but we don't know if we're locking that person up right now. Exactly. Wow, thank you so much. We have a question concerning collateral consequences. Are there legal remedies aside from legislative advocacy to address the civil punishments that continue to indefinitely punish people long after their sentence has ended? I mean, it certainly has been litigation. Um, I mean, if you think about 
litigation in the employment context, which, which deals with disparate impact, right, of these consequences on individuals of color. We think about all litigation around voting rights. So there's been, actually been lots of litigation focused on particular consequences. And so obviously those are all in the spirit of seeking um, legal relief. Um, I mean, I will say, at least within the criminal legal system itself, um, you know, it's it's been hard to sort of litigate, um, for instance, that individuals should have been informed of these consequences before they attach because, you know, courts have said, you know, these don't sort of sit within the criminal legal system, so therefore they're not part of the criminal defense representation. There are some exceptions when we deal with immigration consequences. The Supreme Court um, decided Padilla versus Kentucky back in 2009 on that, on that particular issue. Um, but, you know, I think part of this part of this panel is about and particularly with the civil rights section of, of, of the ABA is about using the expertise of civil rights attorneys. Right. To come up with theories to attack these consequences, um, particularly along the lines of of race. I mean, I think that on the policy side it's you know, obviously it's about race, but it's also about how these these consequences just. They're way too broad, right? They're disconnected from this particular individual, right? They apply just these blanket consequences that apply to everybody. Um, but we still need to come up with obviously legal hooks to say, well, this is why, you know, we have an issue with regard to the Constitution, with regard to these consequences. That's what civil rights attorneys are an expert in doing. But no, there's lots of, it's been lots of litigation on, the, on these issues going back you know, a couple of decades now. <clears throat> Great. We're going to turn back to private prisons. Um, this question says, the president of the United States is dis dismantling private prisons. Is that just for the federal prisons? We have so many pro profit prisons in Oklahoma. I would like to shut them all down. Yeah, I mean, you know, the idea is to do away with all, but, but it's limited on what the federal government can tell states to do with their criminal justice system. It's, it's limited on, on their power to do that. They have to incentivize them by saying, we won't give you this money unless you do this. Um, but, but let's think about that for a second though. When we talk about doing away with them, what happens to the people within them? And what happens is when you rush to do something, just to do it, you create an even bigger problem. So he, I'll give you the example of in Chicago when they tore down all the projects. Like no one thought that mixing in different neighborhoods with people from the project will create gang conflicts because they didn't have anyone from the community helping them make that decision to say, hold up, don't do it yet because of this. And now you see what's going on in Chicago and it's directly attributed to when these project housings were torn down. So when we talk about tearing down, you know, private prisons or getting rid of them, I don't want to just rush to do something without us thinking it out. Where are we going to send people at? Where are they going? Are we sending people to worse condition prisons? Because there are some prisons where it's like, look, you, you know, you could take a look at some of the, the the reports that were coming out of, you know, Louisiana and, and also, you know, Alabama during this, this crisis. So I think that there needs to be a plan, but you cannot have a plan and make and putting any plan in place without the people who have been affected by it. And let me just, just to follow up, um, you know, this is about politics as well, right? So in the Obama administration, they reduced the reliance on private prisons. During the Trump administration, they did away with that executive order and, right, implemented their executive order to say, let's ramp up the private prisons. And then Biden, when he took office, said, you know, issued an executive order um, to, you know, stop the reliance on, on private prisons. So again, you know, obviously we know that, that, that that much of what we're talking about, particularly at the legislative level, it, you know, there's, there's a level of politics involved. But, but you know, again, our job as lawyers is to even get these decision makers to see the justice of it. Because quite honestly, the next president could do away with Biden's executive order and then ramp up private prisons, you know, again. Um, so, but yes, Biden did sign an order to reduce, to eliminate the reliance on private prisons. Great. Thank you so much. We have about five minutes left. I wanna provide the opportunity for the panelists to leave us with one takeaway, maybe one charge to the attendees that they can do uh, once they leave here today to push forward for change. And I'll start with Attorney Adams. 
So I, I'll say this. I, I want to see, you know, if, if everyone could, uh, one or one or both. And this is what I mean by that. I want to see one, you know, attorney or one person um, in this field take on one case and groom one person, right? Um, that's how we chip away at this thing. We can't think about this thing um, as if we can get a mop bucket and go clean it up because it was created and, and, and instituted and running for too many years for us to be able to just clean it up with one one swipe. So I want everyone to do the one or one or both. Just pick up one case or groom one person or do both. Um, and you can reach out to, to me, whatever race resources my nonprofit has is available. Um, we, we have a lot of stuff. We can point you to a lot of stuff, but just one. It doesn't matter if it's a youth case. It doesn't matter what it is, but it has to be criminal justice reform um, focused because that's how we chip away at it. Encourage, if every big firm that you can think of in their county alone just committed a percentage of their pro bono dollars to affecting and representing you know people in that county so much change will come about melanie i can't thank you enough for this again i love my panelists um the opportunity as well in the aba please have me back again i thank you all thank you attorney adam let's turn to miss mimi any closing thoughts Yes, thank you so much, Ms. Melanie. Um, I would want I want people to know that people in incarcerated spaces are human beings and they shouldn't be treated any less. They're humans as well. And any person that is coming forward to state that they're innocent or they need some type of help or support, please listen to them because you might just be saving someone's life. The people need the support and please just help people in there. Thank you again. Thank you so much for having me here. Thank you for that. Professor Pernard? Um, we need a reckoning, right? In the context of policing now, we see this reckoning on policing that includes the history of policing. We need the same for mass incarceration, right? We need a reckoning on the history and the present of mass incarceration. And um, some in the chat, um, Aurelia Denby talked about the private prison industry, about how you know, sort of, I think, response to my point about the politics, and she makes an excellent point that it's beyond politics, right? This is about the, the sort of the industry of even the private, print, private prison industry, right? Again, the economic aspect of it. But certainly, when we call for this reckoning, it, it is about, again, the history and the present, which includes everything related to mass incarceration, undergirded, obviously, by sort of the, the, the economics of it. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of the attendees today for joining us for the webinar, The Effects of Mass Incarceration on Communities of Color in the Wake of COVID-19. We would like to express our profound gratitude to our esteemed panel. You all are just doing such great critical work and we thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to share your experiences and ideas for meaningful reform. Thank you. The American Bar Association Section of Civil Rights and Social Justice provides free webinars and resources for legal professionals and advocates nationwide. We hope this program helps you in your work. If you can, please consider joining and becoming active in the ABA. You may do so by visiting ambar.org crsj. Thank you so much and please stay safe.